This is a map of the Navajo Nation. But wait, look at this. You see these squares? They form a massive checkerboard of land, almost 150 miles wide, unbeknownst to the entire world. And they're not alone. So what are these checkerboards? Why are they all over the United States? And why does no one know about them? This is more than just a story about squares on the map. It's a story about colonialism, geography, economics at its best and worst. So let's figure out together what land checkerboarding is and the reason why it exists. Oh, sorry, not one reason. Three. So what is land checkerboarding? Well, to understand that, we need to first understand land. Nearly every piece of land on Earth is owned by a government, except for a few notable exceptions here and there. By own, that just means it is within your rights to do certain things with the land, including, often, exploiting the land for as much as you can. There are different legal definitions for owning the land itself, what's under it, and the airspace above, but we'll get into that later. Of course, regular people and companies can own land as well. The thing is, historically and now, land is a very precious thing. There's only so much of it to go around. And so, the investment of land for the future, or for immediate gain, is something that will become somewhat of a recurring theme in this video. So, land checkerboarding is just a situation where two or more parties happen to both own land in an area, such that they share little alternating squares of land, like a checkerboard. Now, let's just stop there and think about just how ridiculous that is. Nature is fluid, it doesn't follow 90 degree angles or really care what direction north is. But America, in their endless fascination with perfectly straight corners, decided that this would be the best system of divvying up land to people, and even more, that a checkerboard would be the optimal way of doing it. So why on earth, then, did we decide that land should be cut up into squares in the first place? Let's look at Europe for a second. There's not a single country with straight lines. Instead, Europe's relatively varied geography means that natural borders following mountains and rivers, for example, worked a lot better. Look in America, at least at the state level, you'll see that this works around the same way. States in the US on the east with more distinct natural features follow more jagged borders. While on the west, in the endless expanse of prairie and desert, we get these perfectly straight lines. So it might be tempting to just leave the answer there, right? Alas, this is reality, and reality tends to give us pretty unsatisfying answers. Let's go way back to the American Revolution. Remember, America didn't always look like this. Back then, it looked a bit more like this. So they just won their first big war, and they're feeling pretty happy about it. Look at all this new land we stole from the Brits, they say, as they happily pose for a painting. The painting was never completed, as the Brits refused to pose. Where did all this land come from, you might ask? You might think that the British gave America this land, but they didn't. In what seems like a first ever for British colonialism, they actually decided to save this land for the indigenous inhabitants the Royal Proclamation of 1763, but instead, they're forced to hand over this land to America. So imagine you're America right now. You just won yourself a ton of land, far more than you had before. What do you do next? Well, it's not really your land until your people are living there, and to convince people to live in some random new land, you've got to figure out what the land you just claimed actually looks like. Remember, at this point, no one on either side knows what this theoretical land even looks like. For all they know, the land might not even be there. So America, specifically Congress, passes this thing called the Land Ordinance of 1785, which was in charge of land surveying, or going out into land, mapping what you see there, and dividing it into plots to be sold. Okay, so now here's where it gets interesting. How do you think the good old Europeans had been doing land surveying for all this time? Remember, they don't have Google Maps or giant cameras flying in space. What they did have were trees and rocks, and so that's how they divided land. A typical land plot using the meets and bounds definition could go something like this. Start at this corner between two walls near an apple tree, then go north 150 rods to the wall near the road, and then east until hit this oak tree or something like that. Obviously, this was not a very good system. If someone cut down that oak tree, for example, you just don't know where your land is anymore. And so America is thinking, we need a new system, one that isn't as inconsistent and works regardless of what the land looks like. And luckily, that was also around the time that math and science came around. And America's like, ooh, look at all these new fancy tools. We now know exactly how long a mile is, and we know where north is. And so they decide on the Public Land Survey System, or PLSS. And it goes something like this. 
Start by planning two lines, one being the baseline going horizontally and one being the meridian going vertically. Using these two lines, create a grid of 6 mile by 6 mile squares. Each of these squares would be called townships, and inside each township were 36 smaller squares, 1 mile by 1 mile, and each of these smaller squares could be surveyed and sold to settlers. Using this system, they ended up surveying over 3 quarters of America's land, basically wherever they could. Which is why, today, nearly every corner of America on a map is cut up into these squares. Of course, one downfall of the system is that, well, the Earth isn't a giant grid. Rivers don't flow in perfectly straight lines all the time, sorry, never. And as we've seen so many times in history, arbitrary straight lines in nature don't work very well. And more obviously, the Earth is not flat! So there's so many sections where the ye olde map makers had to slightly adjust for the Earth's curvature to keep going straight. But okay, America's pretty happy with this. Their people are now moving west, buying up all this land, and it seems like things are alright. Now let's fast forward to the 1850s. America's going wild up there, buying up this land in 1803, fighting Mexico, and they just won Texas in 1848, and they look comparatively huge now. But again, same problem. If you don't have people living there, then it doesn't really feel like it's your land. And so now, it's time to look at the second piece of the puzzle, railroads. Okay, let's go on a bit of a tangent here, so bear with me, and let's meet this guy now, Asa Whitney. He's not the first nor only reason for checkerboarding to start, but after researching for a year and the fact that he's a bit of a character, I think his story will be a fun example to look at. So Whitney, right, he's a businessman in New York at the time when there was a massive panic and many banks started to fail. Whitney, his property and livelihood now in danger, decides to take a gamble, and he books the next ship to China. Why China? I don't know. Now, remember at the time, there were no commercial planes or anything, and sea voyages were pretty slow. How slow? A flight today from New York to China probably takes around 20 hours. A fast ship of the time took 80 days. Whitney's ship, 160 days in probably some of the worst conditions imaginable. So you can imagine, this guy's probably not that happy at this point. But he's in China now during the Opium Wars, and he did pretty well there. Through his business ventures, he now has enough money to retire. But this Whitney guy and said he goes back to New York and he's like, guys, China's like crazy good for business. Like, we have to go back, send like a couple hundred dudes to China or something. Okay, he probably wasn't that casual, but I'm not kidding, he was crazy about China. Like, in one of his writings, he calls the Chinese those ancient, numerous, and most extraordinary people. I told you, this guy's a character. So what's his plan? He calls it a project for a railroad to the Pacific. It's a pretty ambitious plan. He wants America to build a railroad across the country to get ahead of Britain, who also at the time was taking as much advantage of China as they could. Classic 19th century history right there. Railroads were still relatively new back then, but it had proven itself as a revolutionary technology within a few decades. But a transcontinental railroad? That was a massive undertaking. Actually, let me show you. This is a graph of all the longest railroads in America at the time. And this is the Transcontinental Railroad. Maybe they could have afforded all those smaller railroads, but this one would be unbelievably expensive. So let's look at the problem again. America just won a ton of land from the wars, and Whitney proposes that they should build a railroad across the country to beat Britain. Now America was already thinking about something like this, but again, this is a problem. So on top of the government needing to pour a ton of money in this project, Whitney wanted some more money to front the cost. So once again, he goes back to the classic idea, sell land to settlers moving west. Whitney proposes in his plan that America would sell him about 80 million acres of land at 10 cents per acre. Essentially, where the railroad goes, he wants a band of land 60 miles wide. And whenever his railroad finishes another few miles, they'll sell off all that land to sellers at a higher price and make enough money to fund the next few miles of railroad. How does that work? If you had quick access to a railroad line, well, maybe people would want to buy that land more. So now, the government thinks, okay, this plan actually sort of makes sense. They can make a bunch of money from land that they probably won't get that much out of otherwise. And remember, Congress doesn't really care as much as Whitney does about getting ahead of Britain. The best part of the plan for them is that it simultaneously pushes the American people out west. But they're still not super happy with the railroad company controlling a massive swath of land that follows the railroad thousands of miles. No, the government wants in on this as well. So they decide that the fairest thing to do is to split it evenly. The government and the railroad each get the same amount of land. But how did they divide it exactly in half? If we go back and read the actual Railroad Acts, they mention something strange. They say that the odd number sections of land are given to the railroad while the government keeps the even number ones. Now here's the thing, you remember those old township maps? 
Each of the 36 squares in the township is given a number, 1 through 36, which is where the odd and even numbers come from. Now look at this. When the government gave the railroad company all those odd number sections, they inadvertently also created a massive checkerboard following the railroad the whole way. And so that's where the checkerboard comes from. So here's the really weird part and the part that I think everyone's wondering now. Why would you split the land in half like this? Isn't there literally any other way to divide the land in half that makes any more sense than this abomination? Well, as always, it comes down to power. The government didn't want the railroads to control massive sections of land. Heck, to them, even consecutive squares of land a mile wide would be too much control to have. And so what's the only way that they could split the land evenly and not have connected squares of land? That's right, whatever this is. Like, I'm not kidding. After a year of looking at these checkerboard maps, I still can't believe that they ended up with this. Whitney's proposal, as elaborate as it was, never fully convinced Congress, though those who came after him, like Theodore Judah, eventually finished Whitney's work. He would live long enough to see the final golden spike in 1869 and died three years later. Again, Whitney and the subsequent transcontinental railroad proposals weren't the first examples of checkerboarding. The Gulf, Mobile, and Ohio Railroad was the first, with the Ohio and Illinois Central in 1850. But there's a reason why I want to bring up the transcontinental railroad specifically. While it was one of the first major cases of land grants directly funding railroad construction, it also set a precedent for building subsequent railroads in the West. But hold on, look at the actual land out here. Unlike the earlier railroads along the East that were funded by land grants, there wasn't enough of an incentive over on the West to have settlers buy up all these chunks of pretty much unusable land. And so these land grants didn't always work as expected. So what happened to all these other checkerboards then? Okay, so at this point in my research, I thought I was done. I mean, if you look at all the articles about checkerboarding, nearly all of them just talk about railroads. And so I was convinced, almost trying to convince myself, that every case of land checkerboarding was as a result of some railroad. But then, I went back to the Navajo checkerboard. You can really clearly see the reservation borders on Google Maps, unlike the other checkerboards that you usually need to dig through some land ownership maps. But those checkerboards generally maintain that old checkerboard ownership to this day, with very little variation. So what happened here? Why is it that there are sections completely solid, others with little blots of checkerboard, and still others with seemingly no pattern at all? So I gathered up my remaining questions and I emailed the US Bureau of Land Management. They got me in touch with Mark Ames, who agreed to be interviewed, and he confirmed my theories on the railroad, which was always good to hear. Okay. When I went to law school, one of the first things they told us is, do not come in under the misimpression that law is based on fairness and logic. It's not. It's based on lawmakers and the needs at the time and whatever's going on in society, right? So I can't tell you that this was based in logic. I know that they'd say for every one section of developed railroad, we're going to give you 10 sections around the railroad with the natural idea that the closer we are, the more likely our value will go up to. And then the railroad sells them land and they build houses, fields, agriculture, and other income producing things for the United States. They envision towns springing up all along the railroad and that is kind of what happened, you know. But as we kept talking about the Navajo situation, he encouraged me to look into the Dawes Act. That's the one I would love for you to get interested in. Which is so let's plans. briefly look at what happened here. Back in the 1800s, America was sort of in that dream of manifest destiny and all, and a huge part of that was getting people out west. But again, there were already people at West, Native Americans, who've basically been looking at the situation like, guys, I know that we don't really say our tribes own land because we all share it, right? But that doesn't mean we don't exist and you can just claim it. But America comes back and they're like, but we have the guns. And unfortunately, that was more or less what happened for the next few decades. So let's zoom in on one particular act, the Dawes Act, or the General Allotment Act. On paper, it's basically another government act to decide how to make Native American land into good old capitalist American land. But as Mark puts it, I can tell you, you read about some of the acts that I sent you, you're, you're gonna start sweating, you get a little angry, because in the legislative comments, they're talking about what they're trying to do, and it's common for the time and abhorrent now. The real goal for the Dawes Act was to essentially break up the current Native American society and create a foothold for white presence in the area. And what better way than to plant the good old square grid? So the Americans basically show up and tell the natives that the lifestyle that they've been using for tens of thousands of years was outdated and wrong, and offer them an absolutely fair and not at all scam deal. Just think about it. You used to live on all of this land and the government comes along and says, nope, you get a quarter square mile. What? Yep, one of those. 
each family should live on their own squares and practice subsistence farming. Oh, and it gets worse. Those squares would be held in trust by the government for 25 years to protect the Native Americans from whites who might steal the land, or until the Native Americans were civilized enough to make good decisions. Okay, and guess what? If you don't pick your square of land, good news, the government will simply decide for you. Wow, I'm sure this won't cause problems in the future. The Americans certainly thought it was perfect, as it accomplished both their objectives at once, breaking down age-old Native families' traditions and practices while opening up the area for Americans to settle. And over the next few years, the Dawes Act did just that. Native Americans all across America were allotted and confined to these small squares, scattered across where their land used to be, while often nearby squares would be owned privately by white settlers and the government. And over time, the distributions of these plots led to the creation of countless checkerboards across the West. Back in the Navajo checkerboard, we see a combination of the two factors. You've got all these random chunks of squares just all over the place. But then, closer to the main highway here, you've got an almost perfect pattern of checkerboard. And if you zoom all the way out, there's the railroad, specifically the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad, one of the big railroad networks back then. And you can outline almost exactly where the old land grants used to be, where the checkerboard devolves into the Dawes Act allotments. So that explains the difference in checkerboarding pattern. The whole area was affected by the Dawes Act, where the government designated allotments for Native Americans to move to. Above the white line, which was the edge of the railroad land grant radius, you can really clearly see what the Dawes Act did to the land. And all the squares south of the line are a mix between allotments and the railroad's land grants, which explains why the land has much more of a uniform checkerboard pattern. Okay, and then there's still more. This isn't directly related to checkerboarding, but in the Dawes Act, there's this thing the act introduced called fractionated ownership and one of the stupidest things I've ever seen. Listen to this. Imagine you're an American Indian at the time, and the land you can live on suddenly goes from this to this. And you're given this tiny square to live on for the rest of your life. Then, when you die, your family, with their own different plots of land, should inherit a bit of your land as well. But oh, wait, nope, that's what would make sense. Instead, in what is probably the most convoluted but American idea ever, the land ownership is split among your heirs, but the land itself is not. So now, if you had, say, four children, they would each have a fourth say in whatever should happen on the land. Now think about what happens after, like, six generations. Now you've got, like, 200 people, each with a small vote, but collectively all sharing the land. Why would the government want to do this? Think about it. If you ever wanted to build infrastructure on the land or make an important decision, you need to get all 200 people together to agree, which of course is almost impossible. And since the standard of living was so difficult to improve, the government found it so effective that this still happens to this day. And one more thing, I want to be clear. The Dawes Act didn't just target the Navajo specifically. There are many, many more examples of this land grant policy affecting other tribes. Back to Mark. You'll see that the Dawes Act was repealed and it was basically said, you know, why the heck did we ever do this? But now, looking at it 200 years later as we put together all the bits and pieces of the land of the reservation today, we finally see what a century of colonial rule does to the land and the people living on that land. So that brings us to today. I promised three reasons, right? Well, that was five rewrites of the script to go, but who's keeping track anyway? So we've discussed how the old railroad grants caused the majority of checkerboarded land, how the Dawes Act made it worse, and today checkerboarding continues through, well, just buying pieces of land in a checkerboard pattern. But surely no one would do that on purpose, right? Well, it turns out there might be a reason, and it's pretty ridiculous. Here, I've got a pretty obvious question for you. Should it be legal to walk across this corner if you're allowed on these two plots? Common sense says, of course it should be legal. But since common sense is through the window in this video, turns out no one actually knows, and there's a $7 million lawsuit to answer that question. So Wyoming's another state with a ton of checkerboard land, with estimates in the few million acres. But over here is ground zero for the lawsuit. The owners of these corners here, Elk Mountain Ranch, are suing these hunters who climbed the ladder over the checkerboard corner for supposedly violating private airspace. While being the most ridiculous line of reasoning ever, the case is a pretty major one for regular people and massive companies as well. Think about it like this. All this land is public land. Anyone can travel here, hike, hunt, whatever. But let's say you are the guy owning the ranch. There's no exact law saying it's legal to cross the corner of a checkerboard, so what do you do? You buy up all of these squares and basically no one can get in. And all of these squares you would refer to as corner locked, 
So basically, for half the price, you've now got yourself in control of all of this land. Now, getting exact sources for this was pretty much impossible, but checking in with Mark, he confirmed that this sort of thing does in fact happen, commenting that it's like having 40 acres of park next to your property. Thanks, Mark. As for the lawsuit, if the ranch owners win, then the idea of corner-locked land gains a stronger position, now with a legal precedent. On the other hand, if the hunters win, it's also a win for all of us, as it unlocks millions of acres of land across the states. Now, it turns out that I was so slow in getting this video out that in May 2023, the federal courts did rule in favor of the hunters to the surprise of pretty much no one. But regardless, it's a landmark case, and hopefully we'll see less of this checkerboard buying tomfoolery in the future. So remember how I asked what happened to the old railroad checkerboards around 10 minutes ago? Now let's turn to Google Maps. What's interesting about land checkerboards in general is that you usually can't really see the borders in satellite footage, most only show up if you look at the land ownership on specific websites. But over here, along the west coast, something pretty unsettling shows up. Not only are the checkerboards visible, but they're cut into the land with trees. So who's harvesting these trees then? Well, remember those old railway acts? The original purpose of the land grants was to incentivize settlers to buy up the land as the railway was built. But over here, in the vast forested expanse of the Cascade Mountains, there's not really any arable farmland that any settler would want to buy. So largely, the plan to sell land over on the west coast failed. Or did it? Let's look at the Oregon and California Railroad, finished in 1869. In the official railway acts, it's written specifically that the railway companies must only sell the land to settlers at $250 per acre. But while there weren't many settlers eager to buy up thousands of chunks of forested land, there were plenty of timber companies who did. And those timber companies paid much, much more, sometimes up to $40 an acre. Of course, such deals were illegal, but who cared? The railroad companies wanted the money. And so over on the west coast, many of these chunks of land ended up getting sold to timber companies, who essentially deforested much of the land. There's actually a really cool map by Mark Graves over at the Oregonian that showcases the land ownership tremendously well. Eventually, the ONC company got caught, and there was a whole ordeal with the government there. The damage had been done, and the legacy of the old deforestation still continues to this day. All along the west coast, for hundreds of miles, you can still see these imprinted squares etched into the landscape. So at this point, I had some questions. Wouldn't this have some pretty significant problems with the environment? Like, has the government just been looking at this forest checkerboard and thinking, hmm, yes, great idea, let's keep it for another few centuries? Or are there things that people are doing to fix this? So I sent out another email to the Nature Conservancy, who got me in contact with Isaac Hansen. Yeah, so the Nature Conservancy is a global organization that's working in 72 countries and all 50 states in the US. So an opportunity came up for us to sort of press pause on the development or intense logging of those checkerboarded pieces that were privately owned. And we had kind of an interesting project that allowed us to hold on to that land for conservation as we slowly transferred it to state and public agencies so that it could be protected in perpetuity. In Washington, our checkerboard project is called CCF or Central Cascades Forest. Something like 50,000 acres in Washington that was bought from Plum Creek Timberlands, which was a timber owner. Because of that agreement, we have 10 years to transfer those checkerboarded pieces to the public agencies. So they kind of gave us that incentive to knit the checkerboards back together. And the thought is to create a community forest. And you would see things like mountain biking trails, hiking trails, sustainable logging that gives the local economy a boost. You compare that to an alternate universe where it was all logged and turned into houses. That's probably like less of a ecological win than what we're imagining. So that's the plan for the Central Cascade for forest is to knit together with those existing public agencies and create a community forest. There's kind of a sliding scale when it comes to timber management companies. Some of them are really, really focused on resource extraction, um, whereas others really do take the time to kind of cut slowly and deliberately. But, you know, as private companies, a, a timber company's job is to maximize the return to its shareholders. In other words, get the money out of the landscape. You might be familiar with the term edge effects. So edge effects would be where you have a chunk of landscape, but it abruptly ends, say, on a the edge of a clear cut. And so even though that square of timber is still standing, 
because the surrounding edges of that square, if they've been really severely clear cut, it can mean that that square itself kind of reduces its ecological integrity. You know, forested habitat is often more advantageous to a lot of species than open air habitat. It really kind of changes the ecology. So I think the more connected a landscape is, the healthier it is, the more resilient it is in the face of climate change, and the healthier the organisms within that system will be. After the interview, I remembered something I saw almost a year ago, this now famous photo taken by a NASA astronaut of a forested checkerboard in Idaho. Back then, I brushed it off as just another land grant checkerboard, but something about it didn't feel right. Most railroad-caused checkerboards, like the ONC, were far from pristine, with recent logging runs usually only cutting down sections at a time in an attempt to somewhat preserve the structure of the forest. But this felt different. The borders were too square, too straight, with seemingly entirely clear-cut squares. So I checked the spot on Google Maps and something else tipped me off. The size. You see, the railroad grant specifically sold land in one mile by one mile squares exactly, something reflected all along the West Coast checkerboard. But looking at the Idaho one, the squares were a quarter mile wide. So what was going on? The official explanation by NASA mentions the similarity with the railroad checkerboards, but also describes something I hadn't seen before, forest preservation. But weren't the edge effects of a checkerboard harmful to the environment? That explanation wasn't enough, and I kept scouring the internet, but every site just kept linking back to the same NASA article. So I checked Google Maps again and I found this, the Northern Lakes Tree Service, just down the road from the checkerboard. Assuming that they owned the checkerboard, I called them, emailed them, I even messaged them on LinkedIn and Facebook, but I never got a response. Until one day, days before this video goes live, the owner, Damon Brethauer, picked up. I, I just know just a little bit, you know, it's like a, uh, it was what's called lodgepole, uh, what you're looking at, and lodgepole is kind of like a weed of the forest. And so they went in and they just uh, clear cut, you know, those sections. Uh, I think I'm back in like the 80s, I guess, maybe the 90s. But um, that's why they, they did it. And it was also a, a experimental forest. I'm just presuming. I do know like the, the lodge hole, it just, it isn't the best tree in the world. I don't, I don't know if they ever even, even replant those. You know, they would plant a different tree in that area. But um, like if you called the state of Idaho, they'd really be able to answer it for you. So the next morning, Hi, um, I'm Hinson. I'm doing a documentary about land checkerboarding in the USA. Could you give me a bit of like a background on why there is a checkerboard down down south of Colon? Um, yeah, so there is. Um, essentially, it comes down to uh, I'll give you the I guess the basic answer is forest management, but there's more to it than that, as you know. So that area is what we call Jack Pine Flat, the glacial hill where it's all pretty flat. And uh, in the 70s, the foresters at the Idaho Department of Lands were trying to figure out a good way to go in and harvest timber. So they were trying to lay out a pattern to harvest it in a logical manner. And ultimately, what they came up with is 40 acre blocks and it's big checkerboarded it. I'm not 100% sure on the very specific reason why they cho chose the checkerboard pattern, just besides the fact that it was easy straight lines for them to run instead of, uh, you know, like a creating more of a mosaic out there. And that was back in the period of time where we weren't too concerned about edge effect and creating more edge and more natural boundaries on our timber sales. Um, so do you guys still like manage and harvest trees there or do you just like leave the trees to grow back for now? We do. And actually we're in the process. We have two um, timber sales that are under contract right now that are going to go in and harvest those uncut portions. And uh, so we're going to be changing the checkerboard here in the near future. So that was it. The trees were cut back in the 70s in a time when edge effects and the environmental problems of a checkerboard weren't as well researched and mistakenly thinking that the checkerboard would help preserve the environment. Honestly, that was much more of a satisfying answer than I was expecting and finally explained why this checkerboard looked so much more different from the other ones. So here we are, a country divided into thousands of checkerboards. On a map, it's easy to forget that these arbitrary straight lines actually make a difference on the ground. Across the Native American lands, we see yet another grim reality of the checkerboard. So where does that leave us now? This is a story that, despite how crazy it is, is known by pretty much no one, at least among the people I've talked to. It's honestly amazing thinking about how many incredible stories are out there on planet Earth, just without a voice to tell it. So share this video, look around on Google Maps, and maybe next time, if you're on a plane flight from Vancouver to San Francisco or anywhere in between, look out the window. You just might see some squares.